And let's open our Bibles. Lord, we ask that you would uh, cause us to understand the scriptures. Like it says in Luke, that you'd open up our minds that we might understand. And then, like it says in the book of James, that we would live this thing. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go with me to Matthew, excuse me, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, uh, this, uh, I'm going to give you some good news. This message was all going to be one message today, but I've decided to make it into two. And uh, otherwise, we'd be here until Tuesday. And uh, next week, <clears throat> next week, we are going to, uh, I'm going to actually pull out the big Marlite board and we're going to do in detail what's going to happen in the end times. And uh, the real short version is this, Jesus is coming back and it's over. Okay, that's the short version, uh, but we're going to give a little more details next week, and we're going to talk about, because I, about a month ago, I preached a message, and it's like I blew people's brains up with it, uh, and there's so many questions that people didn't understand what I was saying. I'm glad I did that, because it got people talking, and we want to talk, we want to dig into the Word, because so much of what we've been taught isn't in the Bible. I've been looking for the, for the, uh, the book of the Bible called Left Behind. I can't find it. I thought that book series was in here, left behind, but it's not there. And uh, so what do you say we actually go to the Bible and actually do what the Bible says? Amen? Well, we're living in unprecedented times. If you notice, if you, does anybody make the mistake and watch the news once in a while? If you are too happy one day, just watch the news. It'll bring you right back down. You get depressed in a big hurry. But if you watch the news, you'll notice that we have a society right now where um, many uh, police chiefs are resigning. Uh, we have the calling for the defunding of the police, which is discouraging some people. Um, we have prosecutors now. I just saw a report uh, yesterday uh, by Chicago police where they are arresting people for uh, things that are in the books. These are crimes. It's written down, but the prosecutors now are refusing to prosecute anybody. Yeah, they're ref and all over the country, we notice what's happening in Portland, where people are committing crimes, they're uh, vandalizing, they're burning down federal buildings. Uh, our various things are happening all over our country. Just a quick little look at it. What's happening is, once people learn that I can do something and there will be no consequences to it, it opens up a wild rebellion. I was watching a documentary on called, Let it, I think it was called Let It Burn or Burn It Down. It was from the Rodney King riots. Remember that back in the 90s? Anybody old enough for that? This whole group's going, what's the 90s? Um, <laughs> but uh, and, uh, there was a point in the documentary that where the guy said the police decided to pull out. And he said when they did that, it lit the match to the fire. When you remove restraint... I want to look at uh, Proverbs chapter 29 before we get to 2 Peter. It says this, Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. The idea of revelation, revelation is revealing of something, that there's something going on. And what is, is speaking of here is that people have no revelation of God. They don't have a revelation of how He works. That there is going to be a day of reckoning where everyone will have to answer for everything done. In fact, the Bible talks about that there's a written code against us. There's like a record in heaven. Anybody got a record on earth? <laughs> a few in this room could raise your hand. I'm going to record. There's a record in heaven, and but it says in, in the book of Colossians that praise be to God, he has taken the written code and he has nailed it to the cross. And it is removed from my life. What's happening is people are casting off restraint. When all people, when, and there's a, a perverted message that's gone out from the church. The only thing they're hearing now is God loves you. Now what people always want to do about God, whenever they hear anything about from the Bible, they want to run everything, first of all, through their personal filter system. Because people want to make God in their own image. They want to take and say, well, I don't believe it. I can never believe a God who would. Have you ever heard a person say such a word? I could never believe in a God that would. And they say something. Anybody ever heard those things? You know what they're saying? They're saying, I want to be God. 
That's really the core of the issue. And that was the core all the way back in the Garden of Eden where Satan tempted Adam and Eve. And he said, you know, you can know the knowledge of good and evil. You can be like God. And it is a trap. And when people don't understand that there's a day of reckoning, they throw off restraint. They throw off and they say, man, let's just party because it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. Everything matters. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Dear friends, this is the Apostle Peter reading, writing to a group of churches. This is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Now think about it. He wants to make sure that we think about something. Everything we're going to look at here is supposed to be something that is a part of our regular process of thinking. Verse 2. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through the, your apostles. Verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he's promised. People talk about the second coming of Jesus. And sometimes they use it in a less than complimentary way. They began to ridicule Christians who believe that one day Jesus is returning. And one of the reasons we believe Jesus is returning because we have thousands of years of documents of the Old Testament. Thousands of years that predicted and told us where Jesus was going to be born. What was going to happen in Jesus' life? They say there's over 300 Old Testament prophecies that are all written well longer than 400 years before he came that were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, if God is so faithful and has the ability hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus comes to tell where he was going to be born, that he was going to go down into Egypt, that he was going to live up in the Nazareth, he was going to do this, and all these things about Jesus' life. If the Bible is so accurate and so trustworthy, then we better trust what the Bible says that about Jesus returning again and what's going to happen here on the planet. I have total confidence in everything I'm going to read from the Word of God today. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will go, where is this coming? This is this idea when people say, oh, come on. You people believe what? Come on, that Jesus stuff. You think Jesus is coming back. And they make fun of people. What they're really calling for is rebellion. Do what you want, man. Find out what feels good. Go out and party. Get involved with what you want because, man, we're just going to die and be gone anyway. That's what the world wants to tell you. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Jesus has promised to return, but the critics, are, are they never change. You think it's new that right now people are saying something about you, your craziness and believing about Jesus? This has been happening for 2,000 years. The message behind all this is a call for rebellion, a call to throw off restraint, to sin and to live just like you want. And don't let anyone tell you what's right and wrong. I remember when I talked to one of our city councilmen, and I talked about the Bible, he goes, Oh, that's your truth. That's your truth. That's not truth for everybody else. He says, everybody has their truth. He said, there's no real foundational truths anywhere. And again, like I've said before, I wanted to ask him, do you absolutely believe that's true? That statement? <laughs> is that statement true? Well, I absolutely believe that's true, but nothing else is true. He kind of had a circular argument that ends up destroying his own argument before he starts. They believe there's never going to be a return of Jesus. They believe there's never going to be a judgment day. They never believe we're going to have to give an account for our life. Right now our world is calling out for justice. Oh, God's going to bring justice. There's going to be justice. There's going to be justice. Those who say these things don't have any wisdom or understanding of how things work of who God is or what he is like. So let's continue to read the Bible. Look at verse number 5. But they deliberately forget that long ago, God's, God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. 
By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Anybody ever been to Grand Canyon? Grand Canyon is a breathtaking place. You have to go to the Grand Canyon. Just don't go into the stupid government stores. I have an illegal book in my office. Actually, there was a lawsuit, and it was removed from all government property because it talks about the great flood sent as God's judgment on the whole world, and they sued to get it off public property. That's why I bought it. But as you go to the Grand Canyon, there's, there's places where they pounded in the, the, these brass places and says, well, now this is 4 billion years ago. And this is 2 billion years ago, and this is 100 million years, and I always want to always ask, were you there? How do you know? And they have an entire government system that is telling you, they've totally taken over the thing, look what a little water did over hundreds of millions of years, created this great Grand Canyon. You know what they're saying in that? There is no God. Don't you ever believe that God ever brought judgment on this world? We are our own gods, and we will determine what is true for you. Now, a funny thing happened when I was in high school. That was in the last century, kids. Um, anybody remember Mount St. Helens? Mount St. Helens. What year was that? 1980, that thing blew? Blew off the whole top. Well, now it's very interesting. Many, 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 many years, 40-some years later, there is, they go there and they do geological surveys. They're finding the exact same Lay, sedimentary layer foundations, everything that they see in the Grand Canyon, but it happened at Mount St. Helens, and it's been there for only 40 years that way. What's happening is people who really want truth are studying something that we can visually see, we can measure, and in a sense, it was repeatable, so it's scientific. Because we saw it happen, we can measure, and now we look at it, it has the same... And what happens, we have a world that wants to work so hard at telling you there is no God. Just a little tidbit here. If you go and you go by where you're going to go across the bridge and you see the layers. Anybody see the layers on, on Barn Bluff there? If they were laid down over millions of years, none of the layers would be even. They'd all have gouges out of them, chunks out of them. Why? Because if they were laid down over millions of years, there would be erosion and there'll be erosion on every level. And very, but what we're seeing is perfect layer. I've stood at the Grand Canyon and looked for as far as the eye could see. And you can watch the exact layer for miles and miles and miles and miles. It wasn't putting down over a, a, a millions of years a little. It was a deluge. And the power of this water came through as a flood as God judged the world. But the world doesn't want to acknowledge that there is a living God. Look at verse 7. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Oh, really? You're going to preach a fire and brimstone message? Well, welcome to the party! Yes, we are. And everybody said? <laughs> yeah, Steve, that's more appropriate. I just want to see what you say. <laughs> the day is drawing near when Jesus returns as king and will bring every person before him and all have to give an account for their lives. What is the good news? Let's go over the good news again. The good news isn't, hey, do you want to be forgiven and go to heaven? Let me think. Hmm. Fire forever in hell, tormented, or heaven forgiveness well I'll choose heaven well how do i get just pray this quick prayer dear jesus dear jesus forgive me forgive me come to my heart come to my heart i live for you thank you amen i'm saved i'm going to heaven let's have another bud <laughs> party time that's not the gospel What's the gospel? Well, again, the word gospel is the word that was used in the roman world when a new king was rising to power and he would send his people out because back then they had very, very poor internet service. So Facebook didn't work. I mean, they were in Rome. They're trying to send messages all the way over to the other part of the, of, the, uh, of the Roman Empire. So they would send runners. And the runners would run into town and they would come walk into town and say, Nero is the new emperor. And they would stand at the... the um, they, they would have temples dedicated to the worship of the emperors. And they were declared to be sons of God. 
They actually had Caesar declared to be the son of God. So what I'm talking, man, when they came along and started talking about Jesus, that means you're going to get fed to the lions, okay? The gospel message is this. They would go out and say, Nero is the new emperor, and he demands your allegiance. All come and worship. And the whole town would. But because Julius Caesar had made a deal with the Jews, the Jews didn't have to come because he knew they'd be really trouble if they made, made him come. And now these Christian people are coming in the middle of this thing, and they're saying, oh, no, 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 no. The fulfillment of all of Israel's past has come. It's in Jesus. He is the new king. He's the new king. But this king didn't come like the other kings came. This king came born as a baby in a manger. And the first people to hear about him was the lowly shepherds. But yet the angels came to praise him. Lives a perfect, holy life. And then, then he starts his ministry. He shows us exactly what God commands and, and wants. And then he allows himself. He gives of himself. And he lets them arrest him. Because one day they wanted to arrest him. The first time he preached at home church, he preached. Can you imagine a kid coming back from Bible college and you preach such a message the whole church wants to kill you? That's a bad message. But Jesus went home. They wanted to get him. But it says Jesus walked right through the crowd because it wasn't his time. So Jesus, after three and a half years of ministry, he lets them arrest him. The religious people who say they knew God had God right in front of them. And they begin to slap him and spit on him and, and pull out his beard and ridicule him. Jesus let them do that. And then they hand him over to the Romans. And this is fulfilling of Psalm 2, written 700 years. It says, why do the nations rage? Why do the nations plot against the Son of God? It's all right there in Psalm 2. He lets himself be handed over. And as they take him in, they begin to flog him and beat him. To a, such a degree, they say that these beatings, you can begin to see the rib bones and the structure of your body through your skin, your beat so bad. Then he, the Romans, they decided to crown this new king. And this was decided what would happen before the world was, began, that Jesus would do this. They pound a crown of thorns on his head. They put a purple robe on him. They take a stick and slap him across the face. Oh, great king of the Jews, the Roman soldier said, because they hated his guts. Then they stripped him and took him out of town and nailed him to a cross. And Jesus let them do that. And then when Jesus was on the cross, he absorbed, as it would be a black hole, he took all of evil, all the world can give, all that is sinful, all that Satan has, and everything was put into Jesus. And the Bible said he became our sin. And then he died, and he carried it to the grave. And three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. He spent 40 days with his disciples and ascended into heaven and said, I'm returning. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Now you go out and tell everybody. See, our job is to tell the gospel. You know what the gospel is? The living God became man, was crowned king, and is risen from the dead. He has died, and now he rules the universe. And everyone, and every tongue, and everything will bow before the king. And we call you now to bow before this great king. Now, we're Americans. We don't like that message. You don't tell me to do nothing. You tell me to bow. These bunch of religious freaks. So we tell them. We tell them about how the Bible prophesies is, is what Jesus would do. And now we tell them that the Bible's prophesying he's returning. And the Holy Spirit begins to move on and their hearts are melted. Do you remember when the whole Holy Spirit melted your heart? And you begin to say, I do believe. And you surrender. And the word faith, we don't tell people this. All you got to do is pray a prayer. And once you pray the prayer, you're right in there. Woo no, that's not the gospel. Because the word faith in the Bible is the Greek word faith. Pistis, which means allegiance. So when the Bible calls you to faith in Jesus, it was like the, 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 the runners who were declaring that now Nero is the new emperor. They were calling for all of the empire to be allegiant to the king and obedient. Now what do we call it in America when someone goes against America? We call it treason. That's actually a death penalty in America. 
We understand that in our country. But why is it that we think that we can say we're Christians, but we're not allegiant, and we're actually kidding, committing treason on a regular basis? I'll just sip a little bit while you think. Let's look what the Word says. You see, everything that Jesus has done is to be a rescue mission. After John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not be condemned, but have eternal life. But then we got to keep reading. Look at verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world for Him. What is He saying there? He's not, you see, the people use this verse... To say, well, you can't really talk about my sin because Jesus didn't come to condemn. No, no. He came to a people that are perishing so they wouldn't perish. Our sins have condemned us to hell, and we need to get free from that. And Jesus has come on a rescue mission. You see, how you see the, the there's a fancy term we call atonement. Some people believe, say, well, he, he actually took my place on the cross, but that's not in the Bible either. Does that mean that God wanted to put me on the cross and kill me? No, it doesn't. It means that he sent Jesus as the Lamb of God to take all of sin on himself, to kill its power, to break Satan's power, and to raise king over the universe, to rescue us. When I come to this king, do you know what I get from this king? You see, when you're allegiant to America, what do you get? Taxes. And then when you're allegiant, guess what more you get? Taxes. And then when you succeed and buy a bigger house, what do you get more of? Taxes. And then our government spends more, and we get to pay more? <laughs> but we do get to live in the greatest country the world's ever seen. Except for when King David was around, and Israel was really cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's not get prideful. Or we're gone. God never said he's here to save the United States of America. There's no guarantee that... Um, me, Jordan and I were just talking for church. Sometimes the, it looks like the destruction of a society looks like the end of the world for those who are in that society. There's no guarantee America is going to be here in 10 years. We've barely missed being broken apart four different times. Jesus has come on a rescue mission to rescue us, not to condemn us because we already stand condemned, already a part of darkness. He says, I want to rescue you and pull you out. When I become allegiant to my king... My king wipes away my sin. My king comes and lives inside of me through the Holy Spirit, and I am born again, and I'm a brand new creation. And it happens. It happened to me when I was 16. I didn't necessarily feel anything. Because if people, listen to this. I heard this this week. So good. Greg Keener was saying, Dr. Greg Keener, if you say, I don't feel God, therefore God isn't there, is the ultimate in blasphemy. Because you're calling God a liar. Men, whew, we don't have to feel anything. Because you know a lot of guys, they, a lot of churches, it's all about the women. The women go and they cry and they have emotional things and they're low. And all the guys are sitting going, I ain't doing that, man. I am not going near that for a million dollars. Get me out of here. Let's all get our, our, our ribbons and we'll dance around the church. Because we're feminizing the church. I'm being naughty now. We want a church that has men that are leaders. That help women fulfill everything God put in them because they're just stronger than us. We're not dumb people. My wife had five kids. I'm messing with that. Stronger. See, we got to understand you know, how the Bible tells us that men honor their wives, women respect their husbands. If you both do that, your marriage is awesome. Amen? But God's called for somebody to be the leader. It's supposed to be men. And men lead like Jesus. And we lay down our life so that somebody else can be lifted up. Come on. Not this American kind of stupidity. We're talking about Bible kind of leadership, which is sacrificial. I thought I'd get a higher pitch amen than Joey. So I'm like, hey, baby. All the ladies? Amen. Yeah, that was better. And Janie's over there going, right, they got that, Alex. Hallelujah. Jesus has come to break the power of death and to bring eternal life. But you have to be willing to be rescued. You have to be willing to come out of the cage. 
You have to be free. Look at it says in verse 8. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Aren't you glad God, wasn't, God was patient with you? Amen? Let's see. Kenny's here today, back in Afghanistan. We love you, man. We're glad you're home. We're never letting you go again. There he is. I just had to say it because you're so cute. Um, and your home's safe. Praise God. We'll have you give a testimony one of these days. That'd be fun. Because the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Repentance is that place in which you surrender your life to God, you turn from the things of this world and say, you are king, you are right, I give you my life, come and live inside, I'm allegiant to you forever. When you say no, I say no. When you say yes, I say yes. I am going to serve you, my king. Amen? Amen? God's goal is that every person would come to repentance. His desire is that everybody would be saved. The reason for the delay in Jesus' return is that he's trying to wake up everybody. And guess what? We're supposed to be a part of that. It's our job to make sure everyone around us knows about Jesus. Now, you've got to have wisdom. Don't be a weirdo. Okay? Everybody raise your hand and say, Pastor Tom, you can slap me if I get weird. Okay, amen. Some of you line up. Okay, no. Um, But we, we, we've got to tell people about Jesus. That's why we've gone to El Salvador. We've gone to Ecuador. We've gone to Romania. We've gone to Uganda. We've gone all over the world, amen, to tell people about Jesus. But we've got to tell people in America because America is going down the hall. We need a move of God. The reason for the delay is that God wants everyone to hear, and he is patient with us. I am so glad the Lord is patient with me. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. That's a lot. There's a lot packed right there. Let's break it down just a little bit. We don't got a lot of time, but a little bit. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It is not. How many people are old enough to remember the old movie Thief of the Night? Remember that one? Life was filled with guns and wars, and everyone. I don't remember. Go on the internet. There's, this is really, you know, old people don't know about it, but there's, go on YouTube and type in there and find uh, 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 the Thief of the Night. It's a, a hilarious old movie. Uh, just They don't, didn't read their Bible very well, that's all. Um, the part they got right is Jesus is returning. But the part they didn't get right is he's coming like a thief, which means he's coming when you don't expect him. But look at what it says happens after that. It says the heavens will disappear with a quiet. I think uh, Pastor Jordan and a few other kids used to do this rapture thing to people. I mean, one of my kids, I think, was over at somebody's house. And so, I don't know if it was you or Pastor Luke, they went to the bathroom, and so the guys took off all their clothes and laid them where they were sitting and, and hid in the other room. So when they walked out, they went, They're gone! No! Our son Luke one time and Ben came home on the bus and TV was on, things were on in the house, but mom wasn't there. That's when we lived in the parsonage in the corner here. And Luke's like, where's mom? Ben's going. Pastor Ben's on vacation right now. He goes, we missed the rapture. <laughs> now he's just messing with Luke. So Luke decides, I'm going to run over to church. He ran over to church and no one's here. He, rem- he starts to cry. Ben's going, you missed it, man. You missed it, man. <laughs> Me, me and Pastor John always used to talk about, I said, if the rapture happened, he's going to preach next week. And uh, <laughs> that was always our deal. <laughs> that's naughty, isn't it? But I'm telling you, that's not the scenario, people. That's not the Bible. The Bible says he's going to come like a thief, which is unexpected. But he's, look what it says. The heavens will disappear with a roar. In other places, which I'll uh, show you next week when we go through our diagrams and we'll talk about all this, it says that the uh, trumpet call of God, the last call of the angels, they shall see him. He shall rip open the eastern sky. He will come. Oh, man. It's not quiet. It's loud. 
If you don't, if you don't agree with me, that's okay. Take me out for coffee. I'll let you pay. And we'll just look at the word. Amen? The elements will be destroyed with fire and the earth and everything done in it. Look what it says. Done in it will be laid bare. There's this loud trumpet call. The archangel. All these things are going to happen. They will look on the one whom they have pierced. And everything will be laid bare. Everything has done. What he's saying is everything in our lives is going to be laid before the throne of God. We have to keep our minds in our minds that the heavenly prosecutor is not going to overlook anything. Even though prosecutors in America right now are just saying, oh, I'm not going to prosecute that. No, I'm not going to prosecute that. There's, there's groups that are paying for people who've committed murders to get out on bail so they can run and hide. What kind of crazy groups are that? It's just insanity what's going on. When we understand this, we are going to live different lives. Look at verse 11. It says, everything will be destroyed in this way. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to, to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Jesus said, when, in Matthew chapter 24, he says, the gospel will be preached to the whole world and the end will come. So if you want not have to pay another house payment, just tell more people about Jesus. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in intense heat. That day is the day Jesus returns. I'm going to explain this in detail next week. Detail. Verse 13. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, the Lord taught us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your what? Kingdom come. Your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. The problem is, in the Garden of Eden where everything was perfect, the way God set it up, it was the perfect temple because temple is always where God meets with man. When mankind listened to Satan, all they were given was handed over to Satan and they lost the ability to be in the presence of God. Jesus, everything's about that rescue mission. And then it's about restoring of Eden, God's presence with man. Our eternal home is not heaven. It's okay to say that. I can't wait till I get to heaven. Me too. But I'd rather be raptured and be in the new heaven and new earth. Amen? Because the Bible clearly says, I'm going to explain this in detail next week. Those who are in heaven right now are people who were faithful to God. Throughout all of creation, Abraham and Isaac and all these, you know, all the people who've loved the Lord are in heaven. But the only problem, everybody in heaven is still dead. Now their spirits are alive, but their bodies are dead. The Bible says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Jesus has to bring them with them. They have to raise from the dead. And we who are alive and left till the coming of the Lord shall be changed and twinkling in an eye. We're going to talk about all that. And then we will meet the Lord in the air of the rapture. And then we will escort him to earth while he will set up his kingdom. And there shall be a new heavens and new earth. This destruction by fire is all about God purifying everything. Now listen, I want you to think about this next time you hear this phrase. Global warming. Okay? You want to talk about a green new deal, baby? Jesus is bringing a green new deal. All these are witnessing points for you. Have fun. Put a smile on your face. Engage with people. Okay? The Bible talks about how the very creation is angry at sin. Romans chapter 8 says, The whole creation is now groaning until the day the sons of righteousness are revealed. All of the earth is in an upheaval. And you read the book of Revelation, God is actually going to use the earth and the, the weather and the, and the things of the earth to actually bring judgment on people. And every time God brings judgment, it's for two reasons. To get, number one, the world to wake up and repent and serve God. And number two, to purify the church. Back in 1906, when the Azusa Street Revival just started, one week after they started was the great San Francisco earthquake. Frank Bartleman made a brochure saying this was God's judgment. Wake up and repent. They kicked him out of the, every church he was in until he got to Azusa Street. Why? Because people didn't want to think that we are serving a God that can bring judgment. I want to tell you something. Don't mess with Jesus. Because it says in Psalms chapter 2, kiss 
the sun. Kiss the sun lest he strike you. Read it when you get home, Psalm 2. It talked about all how the nations have raged against him to crucify him and how he's now ruling and reigning. And, and God says, you better kiss the sun lest he strike you. Don't mess with Jesus. Why is it? People are willing to curse God. Why is it that when God has so clearly laid out things in Scripture, people say, I can't serve a God like that? You know why? They want to be God. Folks, I don't want to be God. I want to just be a servant. I just want to serve my king. Amen? Amen? I just want to be true, faithful, prove faithful to stand before my king one day and say, King, I did everything a kid just to serve you. That's how we got to live our lives. This leaves us with our final question. It concludes with this question in verse 14 and 15. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, I'm looking forward to the day Jesus comes. <clears throat> when Jesus comes... Those who are in hell, they are alive spiritually but still dead, will be given new bodies just before the great right th throne of judgment in Revelation. They will be judged, and then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Okay? We will receive our rewards from heaven. We will enter into a new heavens and a new earth. And it describes these new heavens and new earth. It just blows your mind. Read the book of Revelation, chapter 20, 21, 22. And, we show, and, it, and, and it says there God's heartbeat. He says, finally, God's dwelling place is with his people. They shall be my people, and I shall be their God. God's not angry. God's not vengeful. But God sends judgment to say, wake up, because sin will be judged. If you stay in sin, if you stay serving Satan, and you don't submit to Jesus, you will be consumed by the destruction that's coming on this. I want to rescue you out of this and bring you into my kingdom. Dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless and at peace with God. The single most valuable thing on earth is peace with God. You cannot be happy without peace with God. And then I look at it, it says, I have to be spotless and blameless. And guess what, folks? I know you, and you know me, and none of us are blameless or spotless in this room. Correct? The ground is level at the foot of the cross, baby. We all need a Savior, and not one of us better than another one. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3. All are wicked and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we need a Savior. That's why Jesus came. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus was willing to take what I am onto him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God, God made Jesus, to, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. My sin was put on Jesus. And then when I come to Jesus, say, Jesus, you did that for me. Will you forgive me? I surrender my life to you. He takes what he is and puts on us. If I will truly give to him what I am, a sinner, he will give me what he is, righteous. And it will be put on me. My job then is to grab it and live it and walk in it. And when I blow it, I go back to the king and say, Lord, I got a spot on this robe. I need you to forgive me. Would you forgive me? And he says, come here, my son, I'll clean you up. And he'll just keep walking with us. He, won't, he is patient. He doesn't throw you away. But when we fall more and more in love with Jesus, just think of it. Alex, more and more in love. We remember the day when you and Janie started dating. Someone told me, Alex and Janie are dating. No way. Alex is way over his head. <laughs> Man. And then one day, I, I think I asked Janie something about it, and she goes, yeah, I like him. He's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you grow in love with someone, what happens? You become exclusive. And then when you make that commitment, 
it's forever. Right? That's why the Bible says that marriage is a picture of our relationship with Jesus. We're making a commitment to our Lord. And when you fall more and more in love with Jesus, you're never going to want to do anything against that. See, the key is not focusing on just, I, don't, I shouldn't sin, I shouldn't sin, I'm a, I'm a dirt pole, I'm terrible. It's, Jesus, I want to be more and more in love with you. That's why he says here, when we started, I want to stimulate your mind to think about this stuff. Because if you'll put it in your mind and think about it, it'll get in your heart and it'll change you. Amen? We serve an awesome Savior who's coming back. And I'm here to tell you the good news. There's a new king. And this king is going to come one day, and Donald Trump's going to kneel before him. And Hillary Clinton's going to kneel before him. And Barack Obama's going to kneel before him. And you're going to kneel before him. And I'm going to kneel before him. And Hitler's going to kneel before him. And Nancy Pelosi's going to kneel before him. Chuck Schumer's going to kneel before him. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot. And everyone's going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is king. And no one will lay claim to anything that day. And then Jesus will say, those on his left, he says, I never knew you. This is in the Bible. Depart from me into darkness. Those who are mine, come and enjoy. We're going to spend eternity together. He's going to wipe every tear from our eye. He's going to make our bodies work again. Hallelujah. I don't know how he's getting this titanium out and putting the other parts in, but I hope he does it. But we're going to be with the king forever, and he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and we're going to be with him in perfection. Now, our minds can't quite grasp this, and it sounds like some type of strange fairy tale. But because the Bible was completely accurate about his first coming, I trust and I know that it's completely accurate about his second coming. And that my king's coming back. Because after 75 years of preaching, the ratio was one Christian for 360 people on the planet. Today, it's one Christian for every 18, per 18 people on the planet. The church has been advancing and continues to advance. And one day, because we have been grafted into Israel and become a part of that family, one day through the church, Israel is going to have a great revival, and they're going to turn to Jesus, and they're going to see the one whom they have pierced, and there's going to be a great revival in Jerusalem. You see, this is all the Bible. It's so awesome. Our, through them, we got saved. Now through the church, they're going to get saved. <laughs> that's exciting. But the th thing is, he's waiting for you. It doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, we know kids at four years of age know exactly what it means to give their life to Jesus. I also have been with people. I remember I went down to Pipestone. I preached one time, and a 65-year-old man, for the first time in his life, said, I will serve Jesus and surrendered his life to Jesus. I prayed with people on their deathbeds. You've led people, you nurses around this room. I remember in Rochester, we had like 60 nurses in our church from the Mayo Clinic, and they said, we pray with people all the time. We just don't tell the administration. They said, we lead people to, be, to Jesus all the time on their deathbeds. <laughs> That's awesome. Why? Because we're looking for a king. And we're going to take every advantage that he's given us to share with Jesus. So today, let's take one moment. Let's take 30 seconds. Bow your head. You ask God, where are you at with him? Are you at peace with God? When I was 16 years of age, I knew I was not. When my father was 50 years old is when he gave his life to Jesus. Others at different ages in this room. But it comes to, will you hear what I've said today? If you're not ready for it, that's okay. You should never respond before you're ready. You should check out the evidence and see if it's right. Check out the evidence. Because one thing I found out, when people really want truth, they're going to dig it up. They're going to find it. And everything in this Bible, I've preached on five continents. I've never found anything on any place I've gone that isn't completely in harmony with the Bible. Jesus so loved the world. He came, he died, he rose from the dead and offers his life for yours to rescue you. You have to call out to him in faith and say, Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me. Amen?
Can we give now the next 30 seconds to praise? Let's stand together and let's just thank him for a minute. Let's thank him for being our king. We got an awesome king. Man, you can complain about the president all day long, but baby, don't be complaining about the king. Come on. Come on. Do we got a great king? Let's praise him. Lord.